Today's head-on is the big train robbery, express messengers cowed by the use of dynamite. The sub-head-on says, Messenger Crutchfield tells how masked men shattered the door of his express car and made him hand over his pouches of money. The engineer and fireman force to sit on an embankment and hold their hands above their heads. Conductor Bert saw the only train man that showed fight. The amount of money taken very large, but the figures not yet ascertained. There was a small crowd of curious people at the Pennsylvania station in Jersey City yesterday morning to see the Adams Express car number 214 that was robbed early on Friday evening near Quantico, Virginia. There were railroad and express employees hangers-on about the station and a few boys whose hearts were fired to the Jesse James pitch by reading of one of the most daring train robberies ever attempted in the East. When Train 78 from Washington crawled under the big shed at 8 o'clock, there was a rush from all sides to see messenger B.F. Crutchfield in the car in which he made a short and unsuccessful stand against seven masked robbers. A few minutes later, the car was backed into the shed of the Adams Express Company near the station, and there the messenger related his experiences. The car in the meantime was filled with people who examined the broken windows and shattered door and made various interesting remarks on what they would have done under similar conditions. Messenger Crutchfield is a long, thin, solemn-faced Virginian. He is 35 years old and has been in the employee of the Adams Express Company for several years. It was his first experience with train robbers, and he says it was sufficient to satisfy all his desires in that direction. The employees of the Adams Express Company looked at the car and then fired a series of cross-questions at the messenger. They saw a red car, 60 feet long, belonging to the Atlantic coastline of the Southern Express Company, a company that furnishes Southern connections for the Adams Company. There are four heavy oaken doors, two on each side of the car, and a regular strip of wood, three feet long and two feet wide, had been torn from a lower corner of one of the doors. There was a bullet hole for the door near the floor, and on the opposite side of the car was a mark showing where the bullet was buried. Four windows in the door had been shattered. The ventilating window above the door was broken as though by a bullet. So far as could be seen, these were the only bullet marks. The casing around the shattered door was smashed and the entire appearance of the place showed that an explosive had been used to force an entrance into the car. There were three small express safes and a pile of express freight in the car when it arrived in Jersey City. One of the first greetings the messenger received was from an agent who has charge of the station. What have they been doing with you, Crutch, he asked. Well, I stood them off as long as I could, but when they began to use dynamite, we had to quit, the messenger answered. He then told a story that was afterward repeated to the officers of the Adams Express Company at 59 Broadway. The northbound train that left Richmond at 7 o'clock Friday evening on the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad was made up of seven cars and a locomotive. A postal car with seven clerks was next to the locomotive, and behind was express car 214 with two messengers, B.F. Crutchfield, who was in charge, and H.S. Murray. It was a fruit car from Richmond to New York. It was a few minutes before 9 o'clock when Crutchfield noticed a rolling noise made by the train and thought that they were passing over the drawbridge on Aquia Creek. A moment later, the train stopped in one of the wildest and most unsettled sections of Virginia. Murray swung open the door that was afterwards shattered and in the bright moonlight saw several masked men carrying revolvers. He closed the door with a bang and called the Crutchfield who was in the other side of the car. A dozen or more shots were fired by the masked men in rapid succession. The messengers looked for the window of the opposite door and saw more masked robbers on the other side of the train. Open that door, called a voice from without. No, sir, said Murray. Open that door or we'll blow the whole car up with dynamite. The next instant, there was an explosion that lifted Crutchfield from his feet. The lower right-hand corner of the door was shattered and through the hole a masked face could be seen. Now open that door, the man called in a thick, heavy voice. Crutchfield swung back the door, which was already detached from the self-fastening catch. Four men were standing below. They pointed their revolvers toward the open door, while Big Fellow clambered inside. He covered both messengers with a revolver and told them to hold up their hands. The order was promptly obeyed. The robbers at the open door held their revolvers on the messengers, while the men on the other side of the car kept up a rattling fire, apparently to frighten the passengers and trainmen. The robber inside was roughly dressed. The lower part of his face was covered with a red handkerchief. He was heavily built and talked in a hoarse voice. He ordered the messengers to open the safes and be quiet about it. Murray made a slight protest and Crutchfield said, It's no use. We may as well give up. They have got the best of us. 
The two messengers then got down on their knees and opened two safes and drew out a number of lever pouches. They opened free pouches while the robber stood back with his revolver leveled at them. The contents of the pouches were placed within his reach, and he took what he wanted. One package which he evidently thought was not worth taking was thrown aside. It contained $16,000. There was another safe near the door. Get down on your knees and open that safe, the robber called. There's nothing in it. It's only a deadhead safe, said Crutchfield. The hell it is. Show me the way, Bill, said the robber. Crutchfield said that he would get the bill when the robber shouted, Keep your hands over your head. Show me where the bill is and I'll get it. The bill was in a pigeonhole. The man looked at it and said nothing. It seemed to satisfy him that the messengers were telling the truth. It was evident that he wanted only money, for he did not examine any packages except the lever pouches. When these were emptied, he backed toward the open door. A watch hanging on the wall attracted his attention. Whose watch is that, he asked. It's mine, said Crutchfield. Well, I don't think I want it. As the man was about to lower himself from the door to the ground, where other robbers were standing, Crutchfield, who had kept his nerves, said pleasantly, I wish you would sign a receipt for that stuff you had taken. I had to sign for it. The man left, and another man outside called all hands together and ordered the trainmen to uncouple the locomotive from the train. This was promptly done, and the locomotive was soon flying away toward the Potomac River with the robbers on board. Mr. Crutchfield thinks that a boat was in waiting, and that the men crossed the river to the Maryland shore. The wild locomotive was thrown onto a switch at Quantico, where it crashed into a freight train. If the switch had not been open, it would have collided with the Atlanta Special that stood waiting on the main line. After telling his story to President Weir and other officers of the Adams Express Company, Crutchfield went to bed in the company's building at 59 Broadway. He was aroused a few hours later and was sent to Philadelphia to consult with Pinkerton detectives. Among the passengers who came through to Jersey City was Colonel J.M. Shackelford, who was an editor of the Newark Journal a few years ago and is now in charge of the Times Enterprise of Thomasville, Georgia. Colonel Shackelford says that after the train came to a stop, Conductor Birdsong went on the platform and was about to step to the ground when one of the robbers shouted, Throw up your hands or we'll blow your head off. When the passengers crowded onto the platforms, the robbers scattered along either side of the car and kept up a fusillade of shots until they frightened the people back into the cars. The conductor went through the train and asked all passengers to produce their weapons. He succeeded in finding one small caliber revolver. With this, he went to the platform of one of the sleepers and announced that he would kill the first man who attempted to enter. The passengers dragged him inside and no further attempts were made to stop the robbers at their work. Colonel Shackelford saw the men very plainly in the moonlight, and he thinks that he would be able to identify some of them. The passengers were badly rattled, though no efforts were made to rob them. They busied themselves for 20 minutes in hiding their money and jewelry in all sorts of curious places, under their berths, in their shoes, and in the corners of the sleeping cars. The engineer and fireman sat on the embankment beside the track while the express car was being robbed, but were well guarded by revolvers. Several of the robbers were in facetious moods and jollied the passengers. The officers of the Adams Express Company said yesterday that it would be impossible to tell how much money was stolen until returns could be secured by telegraph from a dozen different points in the South. President Weir said that the amount was large, but it would not reach 180000 as had been reported. As all way bills were taken, it was not possible to make even an approximate estimate. From conversations with different offices, it was gathered that the sum taken was between $100,000 and $150,000. It is believed that more definite information will be obtainable by Monday. An interesting fact in connection with the robbery is that the messengers were practically unarmed. Their revolvers were not within reach when wanted. Years ago, the Adams Express Company ordered their messengers to carry revolvers in a belt while on duty, but the order long ago became a dead letter. All the cars of the Wells Fargo Company are furnished with rifles and revolvers ready for instant use. It was said yesterday at the Pinkerton office in Exchange Place that the case was in charge of the Philadelphia branch. Stories of Passengers From Baltimore on October 13th, W.C. Fallant of Nutley, New Jersey was a passenger on the train which was held up and robbed near Quantico last night. He arrived here this morning. He said, The train came to a stop remarkably quick and with a perceptible jar. We rubbed our eyes and peered through the windows into the darkness. I could not see anything but a black man who was in the car, who threw his hands up and exclaimed, Lord, Lord, they's got the engineer and the fireman out there with pistols pointed at their heads. Lord, Lord. 
Sure enough, as our eyes got accustomed to the darkness, we could see the engineer, Frank Gallagher, and his fireman standing alongside the track with their hands over their heads, grinning grimly into the muzzles of a half dozen ugly looking revolvers held by masked men. I heard one of the men call out to the express messengers to open his car. He refused to do so, and the spokesman of the party replied, Well, we'll blow your damn car open then. We know what you've got in there. We want it, and we're going to have it. The messenger partly opened the door and started to parlay with the robbers, but they would hear nothing he had to say. The leader stepped forward and hurled a dynamite cartridge at the car. It exploded with a terrific noise and shattered the door into splinters. Then another cartridge was sent flying into the car and made havoc among the parcels and packages there. In the meantime, the conductor, M.A. Birdsong, who was in our car, was vainly searching for a pistol. A passenger finally lent him one, and Birdsong rushed out on the platform and toward the express car. The passenger saw that he would stay in little show with the gang of desperados outside, and seizing him, dragged him back into the car. Charles H. Anderson, a traveling salesman who was on the train, said, our first intimation that anything was wrong was when a series of sharp pistol reports were fired just as the train stopped north of the drawbridge at Brooks Station. These shots were to intimidate the passengers. The effect was magical. No one wanted to get out, as everyone realized what was going on. Some ducked under the seats. A porter stuck his head out of the window, but he hauled it in when someone on the outside called to him to duck in. He ducked all right. Some say that five and some say seven robbers were engaged in the affair. A man guarded either side of the train. The passengers were not molested, and we were all very glad to escape. The robbers worked very rapidly. The expressman I heard had all his money out arranging his packages when the door was blown open. He was completely at their mercy, even being compelled to give an extra bag for them to carry away the booty in. How the train was stopped. From Washington on October 13th. The first intimation anybody had that trouble was brewing was when two men jumped from the tender down into the cab and leveling revolvers at the astonished engineer and fireman ordered them to stop the train. The engineer hesitated for an instant, but when informed that he must stop the train or be killed, he closed the throttle and the train, which had been running at about 40 miles an hour, slowed up and came to a standstill. The fireman and engineer were compelled to leave the engine and sit quietly on the bank alongside the track. Crutchfield thinks there may have been $150,000 in the packages. The robbery occupied about 20 minutes. The place selected was a deep cut. The man who entered the car seemed to be the leader, although a man on the outside with a high-keyed voice had a good deal to say about things. This man was tall and ran about a good deal. He drove Charlie the porter, who rushed ahead at first, thinking that tramps were shooting, back into the sleeper and fired two shots at him. The train crew, the postal clerks, and all the passengers were thoroughly cowed, the terrific dynamite explosion having caused them to fear that they would be blown to pieces at any moment. Conductor Birdsong, who was one of the oldest conductors on the road, alone of those in the rear coaches, showed fight. Armed with a small revolver he had borrowed, he stationed himself at the head of the ladies' car and cautioned the passengers to keep their seats and remain quiet. He said he would kill the first robber who set foot on the platform. All the passengers hid their valuables and many of them dropped down to the aisles in between the seats. There were seven postal clerks in the car ahead of the express car. The postal car was full of windows and the clerks were badly frightened. They had no arms. The postal car had many sacks of registered mail, but no effort was made to get them. When the robbery had been completed, the tall man who had fired the first shot into the express car gave the word, go ahead with the engine. The bandits compelled the engine crew to uncouple the locomotive, then they all jumped aboard and made their escape. The robbers were supposed to have left the engine before it passed Widewater, and the train dispatcher at that station, comprehending that something was wrong, telegraphed ahead to Quantico to look out for a wild engine. A switch was thrown just outside of Quantico, and when the engine arrived, it was sidetracked. It crashed into a number of empty freight cars, and in a moment a huge pile of debris marked the spot where the collision occurred. The engine was thrown on its side and is a complete wreck. The freight cars were reduced to kindling wood. The Long Atlanta Special was standing on the main track at Quantico and it narrowly escaped being struck by the runaway engine. A brakeman had just thrown the switch as the wild engine came up. An engine was sent from Quantico to bring on the train and it arrived in Washington with its frightened and demoralized passengers at 1.17 a.m., a little over two hours behind scheduled time. The train with the rifled express car, still in charge of Agent Crutchfield, was immediately united with the New York train, 
and in 10 minutes after its arrival was on its way to New York. The railroad companies offered a reward of $1,000 for the capture of each robber. From Richmond, Virginia on October 13th, three policemen left today for the scene of last night's train robbery near Quantico. $20,000 was the amount of money sent from the city by the train, and nearly all of that was in bonds. Governor O'Farrell has offered a $1,000 reward for the arrest of the robbers and has telegraphed the governor of Maryland asking his cooperation. This story came from the great state of New York. Being reported in the Sun of October 14, 1894. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave, to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.